Dr. Buford Case Boat will explore implant surgery on dentistry and you. The phone lines are open, so get your questions ready. Hello, welcome to Dentistry and You. I'm your host, Dr. Case Bolt. Tonight I have two very special guests with me. Dr. James Bylan from the Implant Center in Leewood, Kansas, and our very, very special guest, Mary Hadley from Kansas City. And I want to welcome you both to Kansas City Alive and Dentistry and You. You know, in every profession, there is a pinnacle, a, an avant-garde of quality. There is the very cutting edge of technology. In dentistry, this has never been more true, especially with the concept of implant dentistry. With implant dentistry, we can do things that were never even dreamed of before. Now, I've had a chance to uh, be acquainted with implant dentistry for just a short period of time, but I have been absolutely amazed with the results that I've seen, uh, the lives that have been changed by the advantage of having implants placed in the mouth. And I also want to say one other thing. There are many people out there that are watching this show that are wearing upper and lower dentures. And some of you have been wearing them for a long time. And you know some of the situations that are involved with lower dentures. Sometimes they don't fit well. Sometimes it's very hard to work with them. There is an alternative to this. And that is the purpose of tonight's show. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. James Bylan so that he can explain to us just exactly what this case is, what implant dentistry is, and, and what this is about. Uh, it's certainly nice for you to, uh, to have me on the program, and uh, I, I don't mind speaking about something that I truly believe in. And I guess with the last uh, 20 years' experience of, of, of implants, and a lot of people think that they are new, but they aren't, uh, the subperiosteal procedure, which is the, the thing that we're probably accenting more on tonight than, than any other, has uh, been around since about 1947, so it's, it's certainly not new at all. Uh, it, it was a procedure that was, uh, that was organized or developed by some, some folks out in, uh, in New York to, to uh, try to restore a, a jaw on a, on a patient mm -hmm. where they were unable to tolerate the, the, the uh, lower denture. It could be right. the upper denture too, but as the, uh, the project uh, evolved, it, it was to make a casting that actually fit the jawbone, the remaining jawbone. A metal framework. A metal framework. It's a. This is a a a, a framework that has been cast. To See fit what? I'll a, go ahead and hold this, yeah, and you can okay. point to it for me. The. This is a model of a jawbone uh, of a patient who had lost their teeth, also lost most of the ridge where they were unable to maintain a lower denture. And this would be the average jaw that I might see. And this is usually the patient who comes in and says, "I don't think I have enough jawbone left." And uh, usually I will smile and say, yes, you do. Well, this may not be the case of Mary, as we'll get here in just a minute. But We take the mold of the lower jaw, and then we make this casting, which is a, a biocompatible material. It's, it's a, a chrome cobalt molybdenum alloy. And then after this, is, is, this casting is made on a second surgery then, uh, this is seated onto the jaw. Now that's made in a literally a 24-hour period it, it of time. Can and be, then, it can be yeah. made in a 24-hour procedure where uh, the laboratory is right where our office is. And uh, one day the surgery is done to, to get the mold of the jaw. And then the next day the, the, uh, the casting has been made and uh, it's fitted to the jaw. And then the tissue closed around it so that the, the shiny part here, the part that looks like a bumper, is the part that's above the gum. The rest is, is below the gum under the gum, but on top of the bone. This might show then the prosthetics as, as we would see it in the, in the mouth, where this would be the jaw and the implant on top of it. Then the gum has been replaced over the, over the implant, and the denture then, which is a fixed removable denture, if you want to call it, actually snaps on and locks in place that way. And it's secured that way. It's secure, yeah. You can, you can uh, uh, lock it in place with these little o-ring attachments that are that are readily uh, um, changeable if they tend to wear out 
we try not to wear out the jaw anymore. We just try to uh, let something wear out that is easily replaced. Well, you know, doctor, a lot of people uh, that have their natural teeth are not aware of this, but one of the things that happens with uh, denture patients is they lose their bone. The bone goes away. It resorbs. Now, a lot of people are not aware of this, but it's a very true and realistic fact for those people with dentures. And uh, before we go further with our segment, I want to tell all of you out there, if you have a question for me, for Dr. Bylan, or for Mary, please give us a call. We have a phone number at the bottom of the screen and we would sure like to hear from you. If you have any questions about implant dentistry or anything that we're talking about, for gosh sakes, give us a call. We'd certainly like to hear from you. You know, uh, as we proceed with this, I think one thing that's important is, is, and the reason we brought Mary on the show, and again, I, I do really appreciate you coming in and, and talking with us. You have undergone some very major surgery, uh, some very, very avant-garde, very technical, very advanced surgery in order for you to have quality uh, chewing and occlusion and for your function and the fine look of your teeth. And that's, that's very important. And um, I think what I'd like to do is talk about that now, exactly what was involved with Mary's case. And we even have uh, a radiograph, an x-ray, mm -hmm. as we call it, that we can mm -hmm. show the people at home. Well, Ed, in Mary's case, uh, she was one of those people that did come in the office and said, I probably don't have enough jawbone. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, I'm sure that we can treat you very easily. And then after we took the radiograph, we found out that she really didn't have very much jaw. In fact, it was, uh, it was certainly resorbed to the point where the peri subperiosteal procedure itself wouldn't work well unless we were able to harvest some additional bone. And this procedure was done back in 1985. And we, it was still a two-stage procedure, but on the first surgery, we got the impression of the bone, but then right. on the second procedure, we, uh, we did harvest some hip bone, which was the, 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 uh, the tender area, I guess, when we were through there, and packed around that so that we finally got a, a, an implant healed in here that would allow her to enjoy the, all the foods that she likes to eat and, and the security of having that fixed denture. Um, yeah. That really did make the difference. It's really made a difference in your it life, really hasn't it? It really has made a difference. I don't think that, um, you know, like you say, for people who have not had dentures, but people who have had them for a long period of time, and they go back in primarily just to have them relined or because they're not fitting correctly, they are, they are pay those are people who are having trouble eating bread, eating lettuce, they can eat salads, all of those things. Just, the, just the basics the are difficult. Just basic food, you know, people just can't, you just can't work with dentures that aren't fitting. Yes. And so consequently with this type of procedure, once, once they are stationed in there so tightly, it's like having your very own. There isn't anything, corn on the cob, apples, anything that you can't eat once you have, <laughs> once you have your implant. You know, we have a couple of phone callers, and I, I would certainly like to hear from you. Please go ahead. Yes, are you speaking to me? Would, would you go ahead again? Are you speaking to me? I sure am. Okay, Mrs. Hadley? Yes. I was wondering if, since you've had this surgery done, are you able to eat tacos, the shells? I can just eat virtually anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can, I can bite an apple, which I never could do when I was wearing my, just my dentures. Uh, but I wore them for a period of 30 years, I think, before I finally got to the point where there were many foods I couldn't eat at mm. all. I see. The taco sure, it sure isn't a problem now. <laughs> I wonderful. see. Well, uh, this is Bob Derringer, and some of the guys and I in the neighborhood were wondering when you were going to make some of your famous tacos again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Now that's a devoted phone call. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that phone All call. Right, bye bye. <laughs> if we have another phone caller there, we'd sure like to hear from you. Are you there? Nick? Well, I think before we go a lot further, I'd like to show uh, the public just exactly what this looks like. Uh, this particular case, we have what is called a panelapse x-ray, or radiograph as we call it technically. And we have it on the little view box here so that we can see it. You can actually see portions of the jaw all the way across here, and you can see the metal portion right here that's actually placed 
onto the jaw and surgically implanted in. And these are the little, how do they call it? O-rings, them? yeah. O-rings. Yeah, just O-ring uh, attachments, yeah. Uh, that allow the denture to snap in place. Now that's quite a piece of hardware here. And, and not only that, and even more interesting is the fact that there was the, the surgery prior to this to build up enough bone to even allow this to occur and be possible. Now that is really quite tremendous. I, I really must say that uh, you've really gone through a lot to, to accomplish this. I, I realize I have seen the uh, bone augmentation mm -hmm. process done and I have seen this process done. And I must admit, uh, I, I have a lot of respect for your efforts and, and, and what you've done to go through this. And not to mention, uh, Dr. Byland, uh, your efforts in being able to provide this for people. Um, I don't know. You might uh, more or less describe the, the, you know, when you do this kind of a procedure, it, it is uh, surgery. And so yes. there is there's some discomfort involved. And you would mm -hmm. expect some swelling discomfort as far as, is those possibilities. I think sometimes uh, patients do come to the dental office and think that maybe they can have things done and, and uh, walk away and never have an ache or pain. Yes. But uh, it is a surgical procedure and we expect about, in fact I normally will tell patients for about 10 days uh, you really would like to throw rocks at me. We just expect <laughs> that kind of, from this, this uh, particular procedure. There are other other implant procedures that uh, are a lot less uh, discomfort involved, and and. Uh, but this is major surgery. Yeah, I think we have surgery. to consider the fact that it's major surgery. Number one and number two, the results that are we are attempting that you are achieving yeah. with this are again the cutting edge, the avant garde. Uh, they involve very very involved. This is involved surgery. Right. In the case where uh, Mary's work was done, it, it was necessary for it to be done in the hospital because yes. we did have to harvest some hip bone to, to right. go along with this. But even though it is the, the surgical procedure we're talking about, and 90 percent of the cases or more can be done quite adequately in, in a uh, in a surgical suite that's in the, in the, uh, in the dental office. Conventional dental right, office or somewhat we have in, in, uh, in Leewood. Uh -huh. So most of the time it's done uh, under uh, either IV sedation or with even some oral uh, 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 sedation right. procedures and local anesthetic. And you know, patients can be quite comfortable in what might be a two or three hour procedure to, to do this. We have another phone caller out there and I'd sure like to talk with you. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, does the actual implant ever have to be replaced? I mean, is there any medical reason that it need, need to be taken out and redone? That's a good question. I would, I would assume that uh, if we have a good sound implant that was placed in a, you would assume a healthy individual, we have good home care follow-up, uh, good occlusion on, on the prosthetics that's in there, then we expect long-term stability out of this kind of procedure. But it is no different than a heart valve or a total hip or any other thing. There are some times that uh, there could be an infection, some involvement that would make it necessary to, uh, to replace it. I, I don't think that because you have had a, an implant procedure of one kind or another would make you so that you couldn't have another. Right. Uh, another procedure could be done, of even a different kind of implant. I understand. Actually, I have heard that the success rates are well into the 90 percentile. They are. That's very the, good. The National Institute of Health back in, uh, in 1988 uh, had their consensus on, on implant dentistry. And of all the types of implants that are, that are available, whether the screw type implant or the, mm -hmm. the subperiosteal or plate form, uh, they look at them as, a, as about a 90, 95, 98 percent success rate in a 10 year span, which That's is very normally good. the way that you would, you would judge those sort of things. Well, our caller, I believe, is still there. Do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask us? I uh, know. I'd just like to say that um, I had a big fear of, of, I guess, eventually in my time getting dentures and um, seeing this makes me not as afraid. Uh, I, I want to add, does she still have, do you still have teeth? Uh, yeah, but I don't like them, let's put it that way, and no. I'm contemplating something no, on lung this No, time. don't do that. <laughs> don't well, do I have um, a very, very, very small jaw, and I've had to have a lot of teeth pulled anyway 
And to me, it looks off balance, I guess you'd say. Um, my jaw didn't fit all my permanent teeth, and it just... Mm. It Still, never looked right to me. And let me say this: that if we have the a patient that would that would present themselves with five teeth, two teeth, three teeth, it doesn't make any difference. And those are sound st structures locked to the bone. There's there's no reason to sacrifice those for something that that. Um, that is is still artificial. So we use those in combination. So they're good teeth, yeah. and, we and use I, them, you know, with the implants. Exactly. Uh, and again, I would say I want to thank the caller that that called us because I, I think that was a very important point. Uh, Dr. Byland and I both agree that the most important thing that you can do is save your teeth. For gosh sakes, save them because there's so many things that we can do. Once they are gone, it is so wonderful and it's fantastic that we have this alternative. But when you still have your natural teeth, there are lots of alternatives than to just having them pulled. And considering what's involved with this procedure, you should should consider all alternatives before having teeth removed. And I think it's very important. Yeah. I, it just, uh, in the case uh, of, of, of Mary here, she lost a lot of the bone because she had to wear dentures. Right. If there are teeth there, they stimulate the bone to stay there. So we want Precisely. the teeth there for bone stimulation. That, that would be a normal thing uh, that would stimulate the bone to, to be there. Implants can stimulate the bone in a similar way, but why lose bone? It, uh, in the work I've done, it's, I find it very precious material. We don't want to lose it. Prevention is the best concept, sure. and I think that's really important. Um, Mary, I know this has changed your life. I, as a general dentist, mm -hmm. uh, work with denture patients a lot, and I know how difficult it is to work with some lower uh, dentures. It's very, very right. difficult. And uh, we've, I've tried every trick that I know uh, of to provide comfort and stability for them. Right. And I, all I can say is how wonderful it is that in this situation, when teeth are lost like this, that you have that option and that possibility. Um, is there anything else? I, I know that there's a question, since it is a surgical thing, and there, there probably was some discomfort with it. There's no question about it. Uh, did you use any kind of electrical stimulation to decrease any of the discomfort? I, I've heard of this being done. No, I didn't. Not, not in your case. No, and really, I was amazed at after the process of the surgeries, because you see, when they took bone marrow from my hip to yes. put in to, to actually build, they actually had to build a jawbone for me because I just they told me it was like a matchstick down there and there was nothing nothing to build a denture on and so consequently they that's when they went ahead and actually but they did it all I had two major surgeries in 24 hours yes. they took the bone marrow from the hip and built the jawbone the next day they went in and put the implant in okay. It was not that difficult. It I was really lo it was longer <laughs> healing, you know, uh, walking than the mouth I, healing. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you both coming on, Mary. I appreciate you coming on, Dr. Bylan. I greatly appreciate this very much, uh, and I hope you all enjoyed it out there uh, in Cablevision Land. And again, I want to thank you for watching Dentistry New. I'm your host, Dr. Casebolt.